Now, you don't have this kind of an ordered sequence. This is an arranged, skewed misrepresentation of what's actually there. It's a conceptual correlation that is useless as proof of evolution because it's based on the circular logic. But you do see a general order, I think, that reflects the ecology that we can observe today. I do think this representation, however, is useful as a model, as a representation of what ought to be if evolution is true. Now, we don't assume the thing to be true, build an illustration of it and say, see, it's proved. That's the circular logic. It's not proof. But it's a good model. It's an illustration of what ought to be if evolution is true. We have an alternative model, and then we compare that with the real world, with the facts, and that's how we test. We don't just holler and see who can say it's proved loudest. We look at the evidence, and we see which fits the facts best. How do you test this model against the facts? I think Stephen Stanley does a good job of describing how that test should proceed from Johns Hopkins University. He's a very famous geologist, and he says topsy-turvy fossils would test it. We'll look at a fuller description of that before we conclude tonight, but this idea of things that are supposed to be at the bottom on top or things supposed to be on the top on bottom, topsy-turvy fossils, would disprove evolution. Any topsy-turvy sequence of fossils would force us to rethink our theory. And so if you're finding things that are supposed to be on the bottom, up at the top, then you've got a problem. Well, you should have. The problem for the evolutionist is we find that kind of thing all the time. That's really not that unusual. They're called living fossils. Niles Eldridge wrote a book about that. He's the curator of the uh, American Museum of Natural History and Professor at Columbia. He says there seems to have been almost no change in any part we can compare, that is, of these ancient fossils supposed to be down at the bottom that are found alive today. We've not completely solved the riddle of living fossils. That would be a topsy-turvy fossil, but there are so many and it's so common, they really just don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. They really want the other kind of contradiction, as we'll see. But to give an illustration of what he's talking about with living fossils, maybe the most famous one is the coelacanth. A uh, beautiful fossil here of a rather strange-looking fish, but one that we find rather commonly in the fossil record. Described here by Keith Thompson, who's president of the Academy of Natural Sciences, as a living fossil, uh, he says in his book, a fish thought to be extinct for 70 million years, which is about the time the dinosaurs had been extinct. The fish was a coelacan, an animal that thrived concurrently with the dinosaurs, but from the point where they're supposed to have gone extinct, all the way up the column, you find no coelacanths. And virtually no dinosaurs. They look quite like the what? <laughs> the modern forms, yes, we have found them. Now, he says we have no fossil coelacanths younger than the late Cretaceous. That's where the dinosaurs are supposed to have gone extinct. And so we've got plenty of them up to that point. From that point forward, nothing. But so far, we've caught about 600 of them out in the ocean since 1937 when we found the first one. But they were extinct at the same time, well, because we don't have them in the column. If they stop in the column and you don't have them above, I think that just means they didn't live at these places, they lived at these places. And the fact you don't find them up here doesn't mean that they're not still around somewhere. Um, that's the topsy fossils, the thing supposed to be at the bottom that you find at the top. Alan Turner refers to that and especially the implications regarding extinction. Uh, just, uh, what, in September of this year, paleontologists really don't know the answer to that. You think some of, you, some of these quotations are maybe from five or six years ago, and you know, well, surely they've learned something since then. Well, this is pretty much up to date, I think, September 6, 2007. We don't know the answer to that. Why some animals survive extinction, others don't, is one of the most difficult questions in paleontology, and why you see this thing that's obviously extinct, according to the column, but swimming around, they don't know. 
it does falsify the idea that because you don't find it above a certain point, it's extinct. And you have literally hundreds of examples of that. But the thing that really is a test in the mind of the evolutionist is the other kind of contradiction. What's supposed to be up found down, or what we'll call the turvy fossils. Because if <laughs> the, the mammals had not got there yet and you find them down here at the bottom, then obviously you've got a real, real challenge. Richard Dawkins describes the implications. Uh, we've spoken about him several times this week. We should be very surprised, for example, to find humans appearing in the record before mammals are supposed to have evolved. If a single well-verified mammal skull were to turn up in 500 million year old rocks, our whole modern theory of evolution would be utterly destroyed. So he's got his chin out pretty far here. You, don't, you can't find this. And he's rather confident because if you do find it, then he's got answers for that too. For example, we have found that kind of thing rather commonly. One very obvious and dramatic example is near LaSalle, Utah, where perfectly modern human skeletons replaced with malachite are found in a layer that's also found at Dinosaur National Monument, one that is known for its dinosaurs in the Dakota Sandstone. So the key phrase in his statement is, if a well-verified mammal skull were to show up, and when you find it, it's not going to be verified. It must have fallen down a crack. They crawled back in a cave. This is a, a mine collapse or any kind of explanation. You don't have to have evidence for it. You know dinosaurs didn't live with humans. They were 100 million years apart, most of them. And so if you find them together, something bad happened. Something, something got messed up. Well, we went back to the site to see if we could, well, verify. And it's a part of an open pit copper mine, just about 20 miles south of Moab. And where you see the backhoe here is where the skeletons were found. Here is one of them still in the rock. This is 50 feet down in the Dakota sandstone. And you see in the lower right-hand corner the pelvis, the knee up near the top, the foot over in the lower left. This one is articulated or together as in life. Uh, most of them are just bones piled together, as is the case here. Some of these look like they go together. They really don't. They're just piled together. This is one that had been out of the rock for about five minutes when we washed it off there with a canteen and held it up for the picture. It's replaced with malachite, which obviously shows it's not a recent burial. It contains no collagen. That typically takes about a 1,000 years uh, to dissipate. And so this is an excellent turvy fossil. I think there's as much verification as you could ever find. We talked to the fellow who uh, actually uncovered it with the bulldozer. And ironically, his father drove the bulldozer at this spot numbers of years ago. This is Dave Fuller. Uh, and he's pointing to the spot where this was found, says there were no broken layers, there were no caves, uh, no mine, looking at a side view. We see the mining operation of the 30s where his father drove the bulldozer and they hit rocks so hard that they were tearing up the bulldozers. And so it stopped and went out of business and didn't start again until the 70s. And then they went on down to this level where the skeletons were found. Again, a diagram here shows the mining operation of the 30s and then the 70s. Here the road cut was done in 1930 and prior to the road cut, this was completely continuous. The skeletons were found here, again, 50 feet down in the Dakota sandstone. There is zero evidence uh, for the intrusional burial of these skeletons. In fact, just overwhelming evidence against it. If they're before 1930, this is the way it looked. And remember then what Dawkins says, if you can well verify it, his conclusion is evolution would be utterly destroyed. I think that's exactly what's happened. But any time you find bones, they're going to be intrusionally buried. That's just the assumption. But he goes on in this discussion of what would test and uh, falsify evolution, saying, ironically, it's also the reason why creationists are so keen on the fake human footprints which were carved during the Depression 
to fool tourists in the dinosaur beds of Texas. So he's heard about our work down at Glen Rose all the way from Oxford. He refuses to come look, but he's sure that they're fake, but understands that if they were real, this would falsify and utterly destroy. And, of course, one of the main reasons that, uh, for the interest is that you can't intrusionally bury footprints, can you? They are where they are. You can't erode them and redeposit, and they don't fall down cracks. And so this is really better evidence than the bones, which he understands. Several of you here have traveled with us down to Dinosaur Valley State Park and seen the footprints there. This is where the Paluxy River runs through the park, and there are just uh, all kinds of dinosaur tracks all over the place down there. They were made famous back in the 40s by Roland T. Byrd, who published a number of articles, and we can see the big sauropod-like elephant tracks almost, and then the three-toed theropods. Uh, here's one of those three-toed tracks, which is rather unusual. It's raised, which caused us to do some head scratching here. How is it? The tracks should be depressed, shouldn't they? Well, yes, but what happened here? The dinosaur stepped, sunk down, left the depressed track. Other material washed over, filled it in, and what filled it in became harder when it became rock, so that when it's later uncovered and erosion now affects it, the center, the infill, is resistant, more resistant to erosion than what's around it, and so it winds up being raised. This is the raised infill. That's significant for some points we'll make again in a moment. But in addition to tracks like this, we also have tracks that look like this. wonder what that could be. Well, it couldn't be a human track. They'd, they were 100 million years apart from the dinosaurs, according to the evolutionists. If they're together, it would utterly destroy, and so it, well, this one has to be carved, and this is Dawkins' conclusion. We'll come back to that in a moment. I, I was